The U.S. and other nations are demanding an investigation after Belarus dispatched a fighter jet to force a commercial flight to land in its capital city of Minsk and arrested an opposition journalist on board. The activist has appeared in a brief video, but there are increasing concerns about his safety. Elizabeth Palmer has the latest. It was released on the government's social media channel, apparently filmed by the police. It's no secret that Pratasevich was a key figure in the movement opposed to Belarus's authoritarian president, Alexander Lukashenko. But family and friends say this confession was forced and note a visible bruise on his forehead. This is an attack on democracy. European leaders have been quick to react to the fake bomb scare on Sunday that diverted a Ryanair plane to Minsk just so Belarusian security forces could arrest Pratasevich. And Belarus used its control over its airspace in order to perpetrate a state hijacking. European governments have not only ordered their planes to avoid Belarusian airspace, but they'll also close their airports to Belarusian planes and sanction figures involved in the hijacking. After police attacked and arrested anti-Lukashenko protesters, thousands of young Belarusians, including Pratasevich, fled abroad for safety. Franek Viavorka is one of them. How much more afraid are you and your colleagues today than you were last week? Uh, I'm afraid of uh, my life. Now, now uh, no one can feel safe. Even if you are traveling abroad, we know that we might be followed. But they don't know what President Lukashenko, brazen enough to force down a civilian jet to seize a political dissident, might do for an encore. President Biden joined European leaders calling for Pretasevich's release, but realistically, the chances of that are almost zero. Like hundreds of other political prisoners in Belarus, he's probably facing many years in jail. Emery? So, Elizabeth, what sanctions were already in place against Belarus? Uh, the list is long and goes back many years, um, mainly on individuals, but some companies. So uh, the president, his sons, senior uh, members of the cabinet, the judiciary, election officials, and sometimes, because these, these sanctions come and go, you know, they began in about 2000, and they are, they're on for a few years, and they're off, and they're on, they're off. Uh, but the, the latest round in 2020, um, the U.S. joined in and sanctioned the president, his son, um, and various senior figures. The Europeans have sanctioned uh, Belarusian companies trying to cut off money to Belarus. Um, so there's a whole web of them. Uh, the, and, and now, of course, there's going to be another new layer. I, I, I guess that a lot of people wonder how effective they're going to be, because in the past, they don't seem to have altered the behavior of the Lukashenko regime at all. Yeah, you make a great point there. Um, and you mentioned in your piece that the European Union has agreed to ban Belarusian airlines from flying over the block. And it's also calling for, for EU-based airlines to avoid flying over Belarus airspace. Um, I'm wondering what sort of impact that could have on the country. What are the implications there? Well, it's a great blow to the country's prestige. Um, it's going to cut off money, mm -hmm. and it will stop Belarusians flying into Europe. Um, now, the ones who are rich enough to pl fly, or often the ones wealthy enough to fly, are associated with the regime. So it's an indirect way of getting at people who are close to the president. Um, the Europeans want to keep the land borders open so that, for example, dissidents and ordinary travelers and families can come and go. So it's a bit of a dance trying to um, corner Belarus and put pressure on without hurting the people who, in effect, just want better living conditions and a, and a fairer uh, country. So the U.S. is welcoming EU sanctions imposed against Belarus, but are there any plans for the U.S. to take action of its own? 
We'll have to see. Um, the G7 uh, conference is coming up, uh, the summit in it's held in Britain this year in Cornwall. Uh, and there's talk this morning of the Belarusian opposition being invited officially. Uh, that would really push the whole issue of what to do in response to this outrage to the top of the agenda. Um, and certainly in President uh, Biden's statement last night, he said he'd asked his team to develop appropriate actions to hold those accountable responsible. So uh, we'll have to see. But it's such an affront to rules-based order, peace and security uh, that it, it won't be a surprise to see um, more actions coming. Although, as I said, it's hard to know at this stage, this much sanctioned country, what can be done to, um, to engage with President uh, Lukashenko and, and, and make him, uh, you know, behave. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, I was thinking when the story broke, I thought, well, he must have taken into account the possible repercussions, and he went ahead anyway. Um, it, it's a, it's such a stunning move, uh, Elizabeth, but, you know, the world is watching to see how uh, things unfold. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Do you, you have a second? I just wanted to add, his paranoia yeah. may have clouded his judgment in this instance. Um, mm -hmm. So there's just no knowing what he could do next. But I did want to mention one specific concrete thing that the opposition would like to see, and that is cutting uh, Belarus off from Interpol so that they can't, the Belarusian government can't ask other countries to uh, through Interpol warrants, arrest dissidents abroad. The dissidents say that would give us a lot of peace of mind if you just cut them off and say, listen, you're out of Interpol until you uh, mend your ways. Oh, that is fascinating, because I did think, well, how did they even know that this opposition leader was flying and where he was going? Um, that's really interesting stuff. Uh, Elizabeth, thank I you. I think there are spies everywhere, spies everywhere. <laughs> that's the truth. Isn't that the truth?